It was the best of times for the human project. Mankind was at its peak, at its most majestic, a global digital empire that was put on hold by a damn virus. The most basic life form, I mean if it's even alive, the you're still out on that one, it showed us who we really are. A bunch of scared, vulnerable primates, but with a plan. So we locked ourselves up, and as the clever hopes expired of a low and dishonest decade, the non-essential portions of the middle class cried to themselves, ah, what a drag to be locked up all day watching at a screen. Right now I could be on my way to be locked up for 8 hours in an office watching at the bad screen, only to travel back home to be locked up all night watching at the good screen. Man, that was life. I mean, it's clear our problem ain't claustrophobia, we don't mind to spend all day inside a concrete box with a nice view of a brick wall. In New Year, that's called success. It is loneliness that we can take. After all, we're just primates, fragile social mammals. Many, many years ago, those hominids who preferred loneliness couldn't survive to pass their genes to the next generation, but those who gathered in tribes reproduce, and this social hunger that kept them alive was inherited by the next generation, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and millions of years later we just can't stop gathering in groups. And yeah, that's why I texted my ex, it's not me, it's evolution. But this involuntary loneliness comes with an excellent opportunity. Maybe the best you've ever had, at least the most important the opportunity to become who you really are. Because, let's be honest, how often do you find yourself being truly yourself? You're one to your family and another to your office, your friends and your partner know completely different versions of you, but all of them know nothing but your outer layer. None of them have ever dived into the infinite internal universe that you inhabit every day, from which you only pour out the parts that you want to show people around you. Your behavior depends on the people around you. Because here at the front of our heads we have these bony, fleshy, emotional displays to send and receive a constant feedback that shapes our actions and feelings. And it's kinda cool, to be honest, because this process of watching each other's faces and feeling things is like outsourcing the spiritual work of figuring out how to be and what to do, to decide what's right and what's wrong. If we do something people around us consider to be bad, they'll make us feel bad and we'll stop doing it. We'll store those behaviors in the hidden part of our psyche, what Carl Jung called the shadow. But if we do something people around us consider to be good, their reaction will make us feel good, so we'll keep doing it. We'll store it in the frontal part of our psyche, what Carl Jung called the persona. This is the mask we wear in public to interact with other persons, the compromise between you and society of how a human should be. But the persona is just a mask, it is not you, it's just a tiny bit of your psyche. You, what we could really call you, you're so much more. You're all of this. Different social groups shape different personas with their own shadows, what some consider good, some consider bad, and vice versa. Tell me who you're with and I'll tell you who you are. But if you catch yourself developing a persona that you don't like, well, the ideal would be to change social circles. Surround yourself with people who inspires you, who approaches the ideal of human being in which you would like to transform into. I mean, that would be the ideal, but being realist, how many people like that do you know? How many heroes and geniuses? And even if you won the social lottery, even if you knew enough inspiring people to surround yourself with them, you'd still have the same problem. You'd be turning into them. And they themselves live under the constant pressure of a society that's trying to turn them into everyone else. In society, it's so easy to adopt one of the personalities offered to you by the cultural patterns around you, to become exactly as all others are and as they expect you to be. The discrepancy between you and the world disappears and with it the fear of aloneness and powerlessness. You can become an automaton, identical to millions of automatons around you, free from all anxiety or uncertainty, but the price to pay is too high. It is the loss of yourself. In the worlds of Ralph Waldo Emerson, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest achievement. That's why you need to be alone. To figure out who you really are, you need loneliness. But it ain't that simple. First you need to learn how to deal with her. The first thing you'll notice in these trying times of solitary uncertainty and chaos at the individual, the social, the global, is anxiety. Oh, so much anxiety. It's okay, don't fight it. The smartest kids numb it with pills and other substances, but remember, it's not healthy to be well adapted to a sick society. No, anxiety is the proof that you are alive and you're free. And look, 
let me apologize in advance because I know, I know, anxiety is a serious problem and if only you've been through what I've been, you'd also take Xanax and now call Gordon Ramsay cause I'ma get baked. Look, if you need it to go on with life, well, it's your life, go on, do what you must. I just want you to know that I love you, it's just nervously love so don't get attached. And you are not your diagnosis, you're not sick, society is. You're not crazy, you're just a bit more sensitive to the effects of this mad mankind we all share. George Eliot once wrote that if we had a keen vision and feeling of all ordinary human life, it would be like hearing the grass grow and the squirrel's heartbeat, and we should die of that roar which lies on the other side of silence. As it is, the quickest of us walk about well watered with stupidity. Just like fear, anxiety is an instinctive response to threats. You can numb it, you can silence it, but the threat's still there. Anxiety, like pain, is not the problem, but a symptom of a bigger problem. The difference between fear and anxiety is that fear responds to specific threats. It drives you towards fight or flight, don't deal. But anxiety responds to invisible threats. It strikes from everywhere at once, and if there's nowhere to run or who to fight, it freezes you. But you cannot live paralyzed by every bad thing that happens on the cruel surface of this pale blue dot we inhabit. In order to exist as a free human being, you need to learn how to distinguish between the things you control, to fix them, and the things you don't, to deal with them. Ah, uh, let's see, what's under my control? The human condition? No it's not. The heat death of the universe? No it's not. My own death? No it's not. The ups and downs of the stock market? No they're not. The global pandemic? No, it's not. The stable genius decisions of the president? Well, I could spend all day tweeting angrily into the void, but at the end of the day, nope, it is not. And the self-destructive behavior of my loved ones? <laughs> I wish. But nope, I can't control them. How about my room? It's been filthy for days. Oh look, that I can. How about my diet? Well, I got these two hands and a bag full of rice and vegetables that says that I can. And what about this constant flood of dread and fear about distant human misery all around the world? <sighs> hey, I'ma show you a life hack. I can. Okay, what about my mood? Well, earlier, while I was eating young in a filthy room while despairing over some corporate puppet in the White House, I would have said, no, life sucks, it has always sucked and it will always suck. But now, after fixing all that fixable stuff and going out for a quick run, hey, look at me, play my little liar. Of course I can. Focus on what you can control to fix it, and what you can't, let it go. And look, I ain't saying you stop trying to fix the world, the world's a mess, it needs a lot of fixing. I believe that if you pay attention, say the truth and take care of yourself, one day you'll have enough responsibility left to take care of yourself and your family. Keep it up, and when you're on top of that game, you'll be responsible for your own community. Once you dominate that area, man, you might be the kind of person that's needed to run your own nation state. Keep it up, pay attention, tell the truth and take as much responsibility as you can bear and one day the whole world will look at you for help. But if you can't even take care of yourself, well, it won't. You can do this, you just need a routine. Ah, but I don't like that word, it sounds like great cubicles and crossfit trainers. Let's call it a cycle. You need a daily cycle that covers your most basic needs. This is gonna sound a bit, um, morbid, but back in the day when this lovely fella was figuring out how to build the perfect prison, you know, as one does, he figured out that not only do you need a constant one-sided surveillance of your prisoners, a panopticon, you also need to impose on them a rigid routine where every second is accounted for, a fixed hour to eat, a fixed hour to work out, a fixed hour to sleep, you need to keep them busy. Don't give them a second of free time because that time they spend eating, working out or sleeping is time they're not committing crimes or planning an escape. And then our friend Jeremy arrived to the conclusion that these principles of surveillance and control could be applied on larger scales. Why stop at a prison when you could work it at a school, hospitals, corporations, society, you could even have a panopticon country. Man, wouldn't that suck balls? And look, I'm not a criminal, I don't need no one to control my time to prevent criminal activity, but I do spend some considerable amount of time on a bunch of stuff that I don't feel so proud of. Stuff that I would love to replace with some other more nourishing activities. Look, 
you're probably not a criminal, I mean I hope, but you do have something like a routine determined by your relationships and obligations to other people. You wake up early to avoid getting stuck in traffic, you arrive at work where they give you an hour to feed yourself and then go back to work. Then you go back home where you seize every second of freedom that life allows you, right? Then you get your stuff ready for the next day and go back to sleep. Then comes the next day and you do it all again. That right there is a cycle and you don't quite control it. It was given to you by habit, chance and circumstance. Now, I have a friend, he sold this and abandoned society, he fled to a little house in the woods, away from all obligation or human relationships. He woke up every day at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to play Total War and watch YouTube until depression and exhaustion sent him back to bed. Well, that's another cycle, and my friend didn't control it either. He might have fled society, but he was still a prisoner of the meat that's packing his bones, a standard human body boiling in an unruly mess of needs and impulses with no one to coordinate them. With no cycle and no purpose, we're slaves to our impulses. Like animals, but without an instinct. So, if you've never controlled your own cycle, I suggest you use pencil and paper, write it down at night, Leave it every day, and with time it will become your second nature. First thing waking up, drink a glass of water, write it down, the handwritten word is powerful. And every night while we sleep, we dehydrate like you have no idea. Every night before you go to sleep, you put a glass of water next to your bed, so you can wake up and say, ah, me from the past, thank you. It's even a self-love exercise. If you have a dog, take it out for a walk, it's physical activity and a lesson of humility. It might be dirty and a little bit humiliating to pick up doo-doo first thing in the morning, but hey, it's not as disgusting as waking up with Twitter. Alright, next thing, right breakfast, wash your hands of course, make it like you're cooking for someone you love. Internet is full of tutorials that will teach you how to follow instructions, take care of yourself and savor the rewards of a work well done. You have water, you have food, what else do you need? Physical activity. Look, I ain't telling you to make an insanity routine every day, but if you're already doing it, remember, focus. Now, do something enjoyable. Go out for a run. And if you can't run, jog. And if you can, ah, you're right. This is goddamn quarantine. If only there was some place to look for an indoors routine. Ho 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 ho, yeah. You damn calories. Get ready to get blasted. We have brains to move. Look at this crazy thing, it's called a C squirt. <laughs> squirt. It's got a brain, not as big as yours, but it helps it move around. Once it finds a reef where to live, it becomes stationary and digests its own brain. Brain's only function was to generate movement patterns adaptable to its environment. Yeah, that's right, I'm talking about you, you brainless filter feeder. Koalas are cute and all, but they're dumb as frogs. They used to have bigger brains till they discovered eucalyptus, which is abundant and probably tasty, I don't know, but it doesn't have a lot of nutrients and it takes so long to chew that it forced koalas to live in those trees, sedentary, chewing your life away, you smooth-brained marsupials. Their brains consumed too many resources and they weren't using it anymore, so with time it got smaller and smaller. Our brains evolved to move. Not to fight strangers online, movement activates its most complex processes. If the primitive man encountered the tiger, its brain would release cortisol and adrenaline. He could run or he could fight, but he would have to break a sweat. Through physical activity, cortisol would drop and stay down for the rest of the day. Then the learning centers of the brain would work harder to remember which ways to choose, what skills to use, how to survive. The world today is full of imaginary tigers and we don't know where to run. Cortisol builds up in our system and it makes us store visceral fat, gives us thinner skin, higher blood pressure, a volatile mood and causes headaches. I mean, if there's nowhere to run, try around the park. This is a quarantine, not vacations. It might be your body, but this is my goddamn choice. Stay indoors and blast those calories or I'm a blast you. The point is to get rid of stress, activate the mind, strengthen the immune system and get to that blissful state where your brain can't keep its functions and your inner voice at the same time so you achieve silence. And at the moment you don't say anything because you can't speak, you don't think because at the moment you're not you, you're the eternal substance of the universe flowing through your monkey shape but later when you remember that moment of ecstasy where your movements and your heartbeat sync up with the beat of your favorite song you think man I wish everyone could feel like this at least once in their brief ephemeral and irreplaceable lives at least once i wish is it too much to ask let her take a shower so you don't smell like a caveman and that's it that's all you need what else meditation i know i know it sounds like hippie bullshit but it's just mental hygiene 
Your attention is the most precious resource you've got. You can only give it to one thing at a time and you can never take it back. The digital ecosystem of today trains our brain to jump between short and short and novelty dopamine hooks to keep us tied to their platforms and sell our data to the corporations that want to sell us their crap. Their business is demolishing our collective attention span. But if you sit every day in silence and pay attention to your breathing for 15 minutes, you'll be training your brain to experience reality here and now. There's a million tutorials online, Mindspace is a great place to start. And since we're talking about attention, dude, love yourself a bit and delete your social media. What do you have to lose? Memes? Hot takes by angry nobody's expert in their own meme field delusions? No one even posts jokes on Twitter anymore and out of those trash filled echo chambers no one cares. I swear, everyone's yelling and no one is listening. It doesn't matter. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And you know what? It is not worth your attention. You wanna laugh? You want a different perspective on life? That's why God invented stand-up comedy. I am sure you know these names. If you don't, please look them up and leave your favorites in the comment section. Look for the specials, train your brain to pay attention for an hour and it will be great, you're gonna have a great time and later people in parties will look at you weird because stand-up routines don't quite translate well into normal conversations but maybe at some point they'll think, well, at least he's not talking about memes. You got food, you got water, a workout for the body and for the mind, now you just need to sleep at least 8 hours a day, at a minimum, cause hundreds of studies show that sleep deprivation diminishes your cognitive functions and it's a fast ticket to a psychotic attack so be careful. Schedule a daily hour to clean your space and look, you've got all this time to do whatever you want, Commit crimes, nah I'm just joking. This cycle is meant to make your day easier, not to punish yourself. It is fine if you miss one task, just trust in the process. Move it around, stretch it, bend it, fold it according to your needs, but stick to it. If you find yourself paralyzed with anxiety, just look at a list. Follow the plan. There will be good days and bad days, but you gotta trust the process. Man, I didn't run as much as I wanted to. That's fine, there's still tomorrow, just trust the process. Man, my internal organs hate me because I order some KFC. It is fine, I mean, kinda gross, but it's fine, you're just human. Just remember how you're feeling now and remember how you felt the time you stuck with the list. Keep trying, trust the process. Man, all my life everyone has always told me I'm a loser and I'll never cheap anything and to be honest, I don't have a lot of evidence against that. Yo, keep trying, trust the process, building a cycle takes time, it takes days, weeks, a lifetime if you're doing it right. We are what we do repeatedly, excellence then is not an act, it's a habit. In the words of Aristotle, or was it Will Durant, ah, they're both cool guys. The point of this cycle is to deal with anxiety and get you in the best shape possible to inhabit the freedom that exists in the empty space of your schedule. This is where legends are born. This is where we do the things that make us proud to be human. According to the Midnight Gospel, Beethoven said the whole point of being alive was to approach divinity as much as we could, to spread that energy amongst all humankind. And I know, I know, Western materialist nihilism gets the heebie-jeebies when it hears about divinity. I ain't talking about the American blonde Jesus riding dinosaurs, I'm talking about the realm of the transcendental. The wisest people throughout history, they weren't dumb, they didn't believe in giant bearded men in dresses. The divine for them was the pattern of structures and behaviors that emerged from thousands of years of human interactions. Emergent complexity from which whole civilizations are born. To be human is a team effort, and this approach towards divinity is just to make our individual part in the collective process of humanity figuring out itself. If you want to learn who you really are, you won't find it in a screen or in the crowd. In the words of Nietzsche, one man runs to his neighbor because he's looking for himself, and another because he wants to lose himself. Your bad love of yourselves makes solitude a prison to you. Solitude is not something that happens to you, it is something you must find. It's a deliberate effort. That voice you're looking for, it only speaks when you're silent. And silence only happens in those things that makes us human. In art, poetry, science, all those areas of self-expression that require practice, discipline and make this world a little bit more bearable. Because it's hard to be human. Being alive comes with pain and loss, confusion, decadence. There's not a single human being alive who's not suffering or asleep. The human condition, I am afraid, is suffering. But when you practice an art, a technique and push your own limits till you find yourself in the area between the new and what you master, when you walk the way between chaos and order, it's like you stop being you. 
it's like all of a sudden the meaning itself manifests through your actions. From that perspective, life has a purpose. As Nietzsche said it, there are heights of the soul from which even tragedy ceases to look tragic. It is from that way between chaos and order that the greatest works of humanity come, the inventions and discoveries that make life more bearable for the rest of mankind. All the music you listen to while on lockup, the masterpieces, modern technology and all the cures for countless diseases, they're the work of formidable human beings who found their purpose in that way between chaos and order and put all their energy into it. And the way revealed to them their place in the world. Because no man is an island, we live in a society, and if we approach divinity and find ourselves, it is to serve humanity. Anything else is just jerking off. Philosophy is not meant to bore people at parties, not it is to write boring academic papers for other boring academics who say, oh yeah, the deconstruction of the Hegelian dialectics of this epistemic, while thinking, man, I didn't get that either. Philosophy is the art of living a good life, and today, more than ever, the human project needs that you stop being everyone else and become your yourself, not for vanity, for survival, so you can help us navigate the maps of chaos ahead, because the society that went into this crisis is not the same that will come out and those who had it all invested in that obsolete idea of the world will try to keep it running, even if it clashes with reality, even if it contradicts it, even at the cost of human life. A society of automatons led by blind liars might work while the world is in a stable position, but the world is no longer stable nor safe. We need free individuals to invent new ways to live and to be human. Free individuals to help us defend human dignity. Or as Stefan Zweig put it, in such epochs where the highest values of life, our peace, our independence, our basic rights, all that makes our existence more pure, more beautiful, all that justifies it, are sacrificed to the demon inhabiting a dozen fanatics and ideologues, all the problems of the man who fears for his humanity come down to the same question. How to remain free. Break free from the system, then from the mob, and then from yourself. Find what you love and let it kill you. That inner voice you're looking for only speaks when you're in silence. Walk the way between chaos and order, and here we part ways. I have my journey, you have your own. I cannot come with you. No one else can live your life and no one else can tell you who you are. Pay attention and tell the truth, sleep well and please don't worry. We don't know enough to worry. Worrying is praying to the devil. It is betting against oneself. Destiny must be faced with courage and hope. Hey, I'll see you on the other side of solitude. Let's see what kind of world we find. Or at least that's what I've read. If you want to read more on this, I'll leave some sources in the pinned comment. It might be just my own delusions ignited by a bunch of dead authors. But a good way to test your own beliefs is to smash them against reality and examine the results. I kinda did that a couple years ago. Remember my friend, the one who went to the forest to play Total War all night and sleep all day? Well, that kid, he was Albert Einstein. Nah, that's a little joke for me to you. Nah, that was me a couple years ago. This, these ideas and this cycle are the product of some years of trial and error. Because humans in the 21st century, we're born in a sick contradiction. Because living with no purpose is a destiny worse than death. But when you discover that the purpose of your civilization is wrong, even suicidal, well, you've got two choices to keep living the lie or let it go and live for nothing. In this video, imperfect, kind of rushed and poorly translated from the original in Spanish, what I'm offering you is a third option. I share with you something that has helped me along these years to find a place in the world, a purpose removed from this ephemeral civilization, but aligned with humanity, the world and the reality that contains them both. I mean, what's freedom worth if we don't know what to do with it? What if they never tell us we have it? I understand, not everyone can or must abandon society to find themselves, but we can all give our lives a bit more structure to fully enjoy the brief moments of solitude that our life allows us, and inside them, find ourselves. There come difficult times, but were they ever easy? There comes a complicated epoch, but this one wasn't so simple to begin with. If there's never a perfect moment, then any moment is right to put ourselves together. And we put ourselves together in order to serve society. I am sorry for putting so much emphasis in that point, but what other clear purpose could there be to life? I've been making videos for a while now in my Spanish channel. This is the first one I translate, and I do it to you, who listen to me. 
uh, with the hope that I don't know, I might help someone. And if that one works, well, you go and help someone else. And if that someone goes out and helps some other people, and that some other people help some other people, well, we can only peer into the heart of the human project through the lens of imagination, but I imagine its purpose would be higher, more clear, and it would be better prepared to deal with the next challenge because there will be a next one. Let's be a bit pessimist for a second. Imagine the worst happens and all our plans fail, all our ideas were false and despite all our efforts entropy catches up to us. How will she find us? Crawling and crying, sick of future dread and anxiety? Or will she find us happy and busy helping each other? Now let's be optimist, what if we survive? How will our response to this crisis be remembered? Tough times don't last but tough people do. Pain lasts a bit, but glory is eternal. Memory is forever. If you had to live the same life over and over for all eternity, will you live in fear or will you live with hope? Where is now the memory of the days that were yours on earth and woke you with sorrow and made your whole universe? The river of years has lost them. From its numbered current you are a word in an index. To others the gods gave glory that has no end. Inscriptions, names on coins, monuments, conscientious historians. All that we know of you, Eclipse friend, is that you heard the nightingale one evening. Amongst the asphodels of the shadows, your shade in its vanity must consider the gods ungenerous. But the days are a web of small troubles, and is there a greater blessing than to be the ash of which oblivion is made? Above other heads the gods kindle the inexorable light of glory which peers into the secret parts and discovers each separate fault. Glory, that at last shrivels the rose it reveres. They were more considerate with you, brother. In the rapt evening that will never become night, you listen without end to Theocritus Nightingale.